just on the road as you go out of um, Bridge of Weir. We pass where the cemetery is that I'm going to be buried in. And, but I want, I'm going at the top because I don't want anybody's rubbish being, you know, nobody's kind of bits and pieces are running into to my space. No plastic flowers. I want um, fresh lilies every week for <laughs> at least 30 years, I think. I think that should do it. And then Gordon can stop. He doesn't have to do it then. And, you know, sometimes like if we're driving, Gordon or the girls will say, should we just let you off here, Mum? You know, again, it's about acceptance through humour, you know, and... and I've had a lot of surgery and each time before, just before you go into surgery you say goodbye It's a non-malignant tumour on the, on the brain It's a lesion and basically the problem is caused when they bleed as children we saw pictures in the embers of the fire We would tell each other stories, let me tell you what they are um, She has brain tumors and the tumors have kind of spread really Kind of all down her spine Yeah, from my own experience when mum said to me for the first time This isn't something that's going to go away I was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't ever think my life would be like this. I didn't ever think that um, I would have a dying parent. I mean, that's not really something you think about. It's not something you expect to happen to you. It was Saturday, five o'clock in the afternoon, and I'd been, I'd been paint stripping a, a door, and then just lost m my sp speech and feelings down my arms and my leg. I was sitting up here and I was getting ready. I think I was going out to, with my friends. And then Dad had shouted at me um, and said, Mum's been unwell. And I just thought, oh, she'd been sick or something like that. So I just went downstairs quite casually. <laughs> I had both my daughters were sitting with me. And he was holding her up and she was on the floor just as you go into the kitchen. <clears throat> he was um, holding her and she was struggling to speak. And I was aware that I couldn't speak. I was trying so hard. And Emily, who's 12, is asthmatic. And she was becoming wheezy because she was getting anxious. And Lucy, who had been 15 at the time, took control. She said to Emily, right, Emily, where's your inhaler? Go and get your inhaler. Just relax, but just walk up the stairs and go and get it. Dad was also obviously in shock because it must have been really hard for him to see something like that. And I could see Gordy was just scared. And I had to hold her while he um, phoned for an ambulance and... She was with Fiona and kind of sat with her and kind of kept her calm. It's happened a few times where I've had to take respons responsibility and do things if Dad's not been in the house or something. She calmed down her sister. She held me up and I could see both of them and how upset they were. It's never till afterwards I realise like, oh, that's what, <laughs> that's what I just did, type thing. Because when you're in the moment, you just kind of get on with it. And as a mum, when you realise that it's you that's upsetting your children, that's the hardest thing. It's just, it's unbearable. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. And that was a real turning point 
for all of us in the family. And that was when Gordon accepted. You could see a change in how he dealt with the illness. Last one. Yay. Yay. Fiona describes it as a life, as a life limiting illness. And it is, um, but we don't know where that, where that limit is. My neurosurgeon has hinted, but it's something that I never wanted to know because I don't know if it's particularly helpful. With this situation, it's so unpredictable. Um, like that fit that she had, it was just, she was fine one minute and the next minute an ambulance was being called. I don't know, it's like the elephant in the room, isn't it? It's kind of a silent, we all know that it's potentially there um, and likely to happen. How long have I got? <laughs> That's not my wish. I was just wondering how long I had for my wish. I can't even begin to understand what it's like for Gordy and the girls watching me and them saying going through the long goodbye because that's what it feels like we're living when you reach markers like birthdays or Christmases and you look back and you think you've really not changed that much but then you realise when you look back just how much has gone I suppose Fiona and I do talk, touch on it occasionally and, um, I don't know. We approach it in a way that will very much cross that bridge, you know, as we approach it. He would find it difficult at the beginning to come to appointments with me. And none of this is because he didn't love me. It's because he loved me so much. I think as we started to cope with the illness, certainly Gordon did have issues around telling people. If, like people phoned if I was in hospital. He would say, I mean, we joke about it now, but he would say, she's fine, you know. She has a mad, massive brain hemorrhage, but she's fine. You know, although I'm joking, but he, he actually could never say those words. It took him a long time. And then to admit to himself how unwell that I was took him e even longer. Um, has this changed or is he still in that place, do you think? No, he he's um, miles away from that, the place of not being able to say certain words and not just saying she's fine. I don't know. Maybe by not talking about it, you're kind of not making that a reality, if that makes sense. I'll say it the other way. If you talk about it, it'll become a reality. I'm not a very open person. Like I don't like to talk about the whole feelings thing, because that's just because I'm like my dad, and me and my dad we don't really do that. Like they're quite similar, <clears throat> um, and that they don't always express how they feel in in words. <laughs> They'll say it in other ways, but not in. Okay, I'm feeling sad today. She won't ever say that. Yeah, you kind of feel a bit browbeaten into talking about things. I just find it really awkward when people ask me like how I feel because I don't know how to respond to that. I just... Those damn emotions, keep them out of the way. I can never picture myself talking about feelings and everything. It's just a subject that I prefer to avoid. I'm always like constantly on my laptop and I'm just um, like always watching CSI Freak. I love CSI. 
I've been addicted to CSI, like, all the time. I just think it's so interesting how you can use science to catch bad people. I want to move to New York when I'm 18, and I want to be a forensic scientist. There's nothing that's going to stop me from doing this. I'm not going to let like this illness in a family going to stop me from doing what I want to do. So I think that my advice would be just don't let it really restrict you from doing what you want to do. What's been lost? The equalness of the relationship between myself and Gordon. We were very much a partnership. I worked full time, Gordon worked full time. Um, I would do the shopping, he would do the shopping. We would, we, we, we shared everything. I would say Fiona's been up in her bed all day, um, not feeling well. And I've just sat down and then I can hear her down and she's she's feeling better and wanting to do something. So she's emptying the dish, dishwasher or something like that. And I'm like, oh, for goodness sake, what are you doing that for? Either sit down or just leave it, I'll do it. Or that, that can be a, because you're thinking, but I'll do it in the morning. You almost take it as an insult, this very old person is emptying the dishwasher because you've not done it. But she's just wanting to partake in kind of family life. Um, and it must be so frustrating for her to be lying up there um, a lot of the time and hearing us interacting and getting on and doing things. I mean, I can't be the mum that I want to be or the wife that I want to be because of the symptoms of the illness. Cleaning, cooking, Pack lunches, ironing, washing, um, gardening, which I, I enjoy doing anyway, but, but the gardening, um, answering the door, taking the dog for a walk. Fiona's med medication as well is also a, that's a, a job. You know, two of this, four of this. And it's hard, it's hard. Because Ever since I was young, I can remember just, I loved babies, I loved being around babies, I loved, and I just feel that I can't do my job as a mum and a wife properly anymore. The way she is now is hard to deal with, but it's all I've ever known, really, I've never known any other situation or any other parent kind of situation. It's always been one parent being unwell and another parent taking control. And that's all I've ever, well, it's not all I've ever known, but it's what I've become used to. She almost feels guilty because she was kind of going out with her friends, going to parties. And um, she's tried so hard to make sure that we have a normal kind of childhood as much as we can in the situation. Like, I'll still go out with my friends as much as any, any other friend would. Or I still go to, like, festivals and concerts and things like that because she encourages me to, so that I'm not sitting here, I don't know, thinking about everything. By like oh nails, God. and they were like, There's something wrong with you. Have you seen like what she actually looks like? She's got, she's just like, she has a boy, she just looks like a boy. She's like she completely like broad shouldered, short hair. It was difficult at the beginning, especially when you're young and your friendship groups are all changing. Right now, it's fairly stable, and they've been my friends are have been there for me through everything. They've been amazing. I don't want to feel like I'm a burden. I, like, we, we hadn't known each other for very long, like, and then her mum got ill, so like you kind of grow to learn how to deal with when she wants to talk and when she doesn't. You just kind of have to be there for people. You have to just say, like, I'm here if you ever, like, want, want to chat or anything. But it's, it, it was hard, like, because we we're so young. I think that it's all kind of been a journey for us all, you know, what's going on. 
and it's good that we can all kind of understand and go through it together. If her mum had like a relapse, you don't know whether to say, oh, she'll be fine, because like you don't you don't know the answers. But like it, we always try and keep it like positive and try not and like we like to like keep her mind off of it more than like always be like trying to counsel her. <laughs> In school, I should be quite closed off and quite yes or no answer then you'd know that she maybe just doesn't want to talk to you but <laughs> we do know when she's upset and we do kind of talk about it with her because I think she gets the feeling that she has to stay strong like within her family for her younger sister so it's nice to know that when she's with us she doesn't always have to like keep it all in. Do you think the society you're in, the school you're in helps you think about these things or do you have to find it yourselves? I think it's quite a taboo within our school really they don't ever talk about it and you just all kind of avoid it and you never really know if anyone's got an ill relative or anything you all just come into school and pretend that nothing's happening which is really wrong actually my dad died when i was like 11 so for when I find out about lucy's mum being ill like it really struck her chord with me so like i've definitely felt much closer to her because i feel like i can kind of understand what she's going through a wee bit more well you have expectations of what people are going to be like and what they're going to do but then you have to set it against the fact that they're 17 and your expectations of them. It's quite a power struggle sometimes between me and my dad because I like to, I don't know, try and make my own decisions. And I'm very much one of those, well surely if everybody sees me doing it then they'll do it as well. You know, like cleaning up after myself. And my dad can still sometimes think that he can say, no, 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 you can't do that. And then I say, well, I can kind of do what I want, really. <laughs> to be a good dad to a daughter is very difficult because you've got no understanding of what it's like to be a 17-year-old girl. She's 17. She's She doesn't care whether her room's tidy or not. I do, tr I do try really hard to help her in the house, but... She doesn't see the fact that she kind of stores up all her dirty clothes <laughs> for a week. It's still a teenage thing, you're like, oh, I can't be bothered. And then puts them in the washing basket and expects them to be ironed and washed and things for the Monday. But for me, um, my dad being proud of me is a huge thing. Um, I don't really know why. <laughs> There's things that he said to Lucy recently, beautiful things, and I think... I always knew that that side of him was there, but for him to bring it across to the girls now shows real strength. I don't know, and it's hard for him sometimes, I think, to say, I am proud of you, or well done, that was really good. And you can see his language is changing, particularly with Lucy, you can see, but he's not as rigid as he was. He's able to compromise and able to admit that he's never had a 17-year-old daughter before, so he doesn't know. You, you do end up doing things that you, you know for a fact that other dads would, wouldn't do, like getting certain items in the supermarket. Is that extra large or jumbo or what is it? <laughs> you know, things like that, and you're thinking, I wouldn't be doing this normally. I think. It's harder for the person watching than it is for the person it's happening to because Gordon is he's so he's so unselfish. He would run up and down stairs for me a hundred times. Yes, Meg. She would, she's <laughs> very protective of me and um, if you notice, she always makes sure that she's in between yeah. me and you. I suppose what, what saved us was the hospice. We all do get counselling from the, from the hospice. A nurse, well a person from the hospice came and she started to talk to me, like we had meetings every week. That was okay because she kind of avoided the subjects of feelings and stuff, so I kind of enjoyed that. I have a, a, 
a counsellor up there and I can go up there. She's just such an amazing person. There's just a feeling of going in there and sitting down and you can just unburden. She offers empathy. A kind of unclenching. She also offers a safe space so that I can talk to her in her that room and then leave all those feelings in that room. I was scared because obviously with hospice comes a, a stigma of um, like death, of, like immediate death. And we kind of went and I kind of realised kind of what the hospice was. We both almost dismissed it out of hand, saying, what would I want to go there for? That's got, that's, you're, ta you're taking it too far now, what's, what's going on? Um, it's like a tiny bit like a hospital, but it's more like a homely hospital, a place to, to die comfortably. I don't know, it's kind of, I, I prefer the hospice to the hospital. You kind of think that it's not really a place to be feared as much as people might think it is. Anybody here tell me what a hospice is? A place where someone with a life-limiting <laughs> illness can just kind of go and like it's kind of recuperate after maybe something like if they say they've had like a big operation or a, um, or like a relapse or something somewhere where they can kind of go for maybe a couple of weeks to a month and just kind of get, get the kind of 24-hour help that they need, but I could be so wrong there. <laughs> well, that's part part of it. That's certainly what mum goes f to it for sometimes, but it's also a place for the family as well. It's not just for the individual, it's for a support base for the family. And Ill people can come together and like they're, they're all in the same kind of boat and it's they can take strength from the other people there who are ill and same with the families. and. In the family we talk about my funeral and I want everybody to be crying, Gordon. None of this, nobody is crying. I want everybody to, I want sobbing. I want, I want just, you know, mass hysteria. And that's it. And I want, you know, none of, I mean, why would you want to go to a fu somebody's funeral and say, look, I want you to be happy. I don't want them to be happy that I've gone. I want them to be devastated. And then as they're carrying me out the church, I want Tom Jones' sex bomb playing because that was always my song and then the family would dance around me. So that's what I want when I'm going out the church, is sex bomb. <laughs> For like years now, like I've not been talking about all that stuff, but now that I have, I feel like there's been like a big kind of weight lifted off my shoulders in a way. So it's good. I can't swear it. I don't know if it's can. well. Um, you feel closer. Definitely. As a family, we're probably close. Or then maybe other. I don't think you can measure if you're closer than another family. No, <clears throat> of course you can. No. Like a teacher said to me, it's like you can either, if you compare yourself to people, you'll either get really big headed because you'll be better off, or you'll be so depressed because you're worse off. So it's just better not compare mm -hmm. to other people. Yeah, but I think we are closer. No, I just no, we're closer as a family, and 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 no matter what other families are doing. <laughs> That's exactly what I meant to say. <laughs> as children, we saw pictures in the embers of the fire. We would tell each other stories. Let me tell you. Jordan, did somebody touch you in, no, in an emotional way? <laughs> it tickled. Showing affection. I know, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, you know. Oh. <laughs> I can show the girls that they're never going to lose me because hopefully I'll always be there on their right shoulder just still 
They can still hear my voice, still telling them what to do, still nagging them, still telling them to tidy their bedrooms, still telling them that stuff goes in the dishwasher, not on the dishwasher. You know, still hearing my voice through things like buttons. You know, just, just wee things. of the fire we will tell each other stories let me tell you what they are let me tell you what they are let me tell you 